respected chairpersons, colleagues, and friends, it's a, uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Rajasthan Medical Association and Dr. VK Jain for giving me this opportunity to speak to you and to visit my home state. I will just, in the allotted times of 10 minutes, I would just briefly give you an idea of the types of clinical studies and uh, overview of that and what has been uh, my experience at uh, doing these studies. Clinical uh, trials you can divide into two types of studies. One is interventional studies and second is observational studies. In interventional studies you have the intervention of the researcher in, the, in terms of any drug or device. While in observational studies you just observe what is happening with the disease and with the treatment. So you have the randomized control trials where a new drug or a new device is, uh, is uh, compared with an established uh, uh, treatment. And then you have non-randomized trials. So randomized controlled double blind trials are considered standard for generating evidences. And in observational studies, when you have two types of studies, when you prospectively observe a group, that becomes a prospective observational studies. And when after a particular time you retrospectively see the records, then it becomes a retrospective observational studies. While observational studies are good because uh, you can easily record a data, it's good for generating uh, hypothesis about the causative factors of a disease, about the various risk factors and the various treatments. Interventional studies are very important for proof of the hypothesis and they are gold standard. And now you will see a lot, you will hear a lot about real world studies where when a new drug is, uh, is just introduced into the market, lakhs of patients are exposed to that. So when you record this uh, treatment, what is happening to the patient with the treatment, that becomes a real world evidence. And this real world evidence is becoming very, very important for both uh, the organized pharma companies as well as the regulators. So this is how we follow the model. Uh, when you want to do a research, you need to have uh, a good insight of the disease as well as good insight of the drug. Just having the insight of drugs is not going to help you or therapy. You need to have a good insight of both disease and drugs and then you need to identify therapy gaps and then you need to innovate around that. Suggest a therapeutic, uh, do a thera therapy, therapy rational, propose a hypothesis, conduct a clinical trial, then generate the data and seek uh, regulatory approval and that's the model which we are following. So I will give you this example of three, uh, three of these studies uh, which we uh, followed here. Uh, in the 2000, year 2000, you will recall that uh, uh, there were COX-2, selective COX-2 inhibitors in particular rofecoxib was introduced by the multinational company Merck and uh, this uh, rofecoxib in the phase 3 trial which is called as the Vigor study the, the drug became more safe because it was not inhibiting COX-1 but since it was inhibiting only COX-2, GI safety was there but this GI safety came at the cost of you know more MI and more stroke which was evident at the you know in the phase 3 clinical trial itself and that's how we you know conceived a balanced COX inhibition where you need not be non-selective and to avoid GI toxicity and you be you know, you also inhibit COX-1 little bit and that's how we introduce a drug called as uh, acyclofenac in the Indian market. And soon actually the cox uh, selective COX-1 inhibitors need to, needed to be withdrawn. And this created a space for the acyclofenac and every other Indian company, including the multinational companies in India, they introduced uh, this drug acyclofenac. So this is just an example. This is a uh, 21 country, uh, in the European Union and the European medicine agencies mandated a GI safety studies in these uh, countries and the data came out that acyclofenac is safer to the GI tract among all the NSAIDs validating what we were thinking and the in terms of congestive heart failure also it had the least incidence of congestive heart failure as we know all the NSAIDs they cause sodium retention and they make the patients prone for congestive heart failure. So this is what we did and we introduced the uh, Cox, uh, Cox, uh, selective Cox preferential COX inhibitor uh, in India. 
This is a GI safety study comparing acyclofenac with diclofenac. And you know as the duration of the NSAID therapy increases, the amount of GI side effects increase. And uh, you, at each, each week you find that the, you know, uh, the GI evidences are less. So NSAID should be used for sh as short term as possible to avoid the GI adverse effects. Then since the innovator had uh, the formulation in twice daily conventional formulation, we collaborated with Bits Pilani and introduced a control release formulation, which was once daily. So another opportunity to innovate was also there in this uh, drug. Then second example I would like to give is a drug called as chlorthalidone, which as a resident uh, officer in Nair Hospital, I had used this drug chlorthalidone, but that time the doses used were 25 and 50 milligram. But uh, uh, the National Institute of Health conducted a uh, largest hypertension trial where almost 42,500 patients were chlorothalidone was compared with the newer drugs, the AC inhibitors, the calcium channel blockers and the alpha blockers. And surprisingly chlorothalidone came better than all the new drugs at that time. And uh, there was no taker for this, uh, this research which was a you know, huge research because multinational companies once a drug is off patent, you know, they don't uh, you know, give attention to that. But this is very, very important. So we, I was very intrigued by this study where chlorothalidone came better than all the newer drugs. So we, you know, what we did was uh, chlorothalidone in the literature, there was also a hint that chlorothalidone is twice as potent as, uh, you know, hydrochlorothiazide. So for 50 milligram hydrochlorothiazide, you had 25 milligram chlorothalidone. For 25, you had 12.5. But corresponding to 12.5 hydrochlorothiazide, which is the commonest dose used, there was no dose available. So we conceived a 6.25 milligram dose and uh, did a series of studies and uh, we got the 6.25 milligram dose approved in India and also did a combination study with both chlorothalidone and the metaprolol succinate. Then we also had the first angiotensin receptor blocker with chlorothalidone study and we presented it in the University of Mississippi Cardio Renal Conference and for this we were awarded the new investigator travel award, the first ARB with chlorothalidone combination. Subsequently, we did a 24 hours ambulatory blood pressure comparing head to head 6.25 chlorothalidone with 12.5 hydrochlorothiazide. And this study was published in the Journal of American College of Cardiology. And subsequently, you know, it also appeared in the Canadian uh, uh, hypertension guidelines in the Canadian Cardiovascular Journal. And uh, this study also fetched us the new, uh, the, the new clinical and research excellence award at Boston among all the multinationals and small Indian company was selected for this uh, award. The study finally also came in the Braunwald's heart disease, which is a textbook uh, standard. Recent uh, edition, this study was covered extensively in two chapters of Braunwald's heart disease. Then the last uh, uh, innovation which we have done is that now both diabetes, type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, they are considered to be a chronic inflammation is going to play a major role in both uh, diabetes as well as in, you know, in cardiovascular disease. And uh, hydroxychloroquine is the first anti-inflammatory drug to be approved in type 2 diabetes. So, you, so inflammation is now uh, very well recognized as a, playing a major role in both diabetes and in, uh, you know, uh, cardiovascular disease. And this is the study where, you know, a prospective observational study of almost 22 years where patients of 5,000 patients of rheumatoid arthritis were, you know, observed for 22 years with age, both hypertension and diabetes are common. But here, those patients who took hydroxychloroquine for four years or more, they never di developed diabetes. So I was very intrigued by this study. So then I looked into hydroxychloroquine very closely. And then we did a phase three study comparing, you know, hydroxychloroquine with pioglitazone. And it was, it came, you know, as good as pyogletazone in glycemic reduction, while in lipid it was better. So this is the story which is covered internationally as well. And now RSSDI guidelines are also acknowledging the same. ICMR guideline is acknowledging. And this is uh, inflammation playing a major role in the Indian phenotype. And uh, then subsequently we presented it at international forums. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you so much, sir.